Hi, my name's David Peacock, and I'm the Director of Community Service Learning at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta. And uh, I've been in this role in community engaged learning one way or another for probably 15 to 20 years in higher education. My background is in the sociology of higher education, I guess, and my academic work was done at the University of Queensland in Australia. But in general, I'm interested in experiential learning and particularly uh students let's call them equity deserving students and their particular participation in um, experiential learning including community engaged learning my name is amber fletcher i'm a professor of sociology and social studies at the university of regina and i'm also the academic director of the community engagement and research center in the faculty of arts at the university of regina my research focuses on the social and gender dimensions of climate hazards, focusing specifically on drought, wildfire and flooding in the Canadian Prairie region. And I look at how rural and Indigenous communities are impacted differently and uniquely because of social inequality when communities experience those disasters. Great. Thank you so much, Betty. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Colleen Strau, and I'm the director of the Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Studies Network which is at Luther College at the University of Regina. My work relates to um, supporting the nonprofit and voluntary sector. So the mandate of the NVSSN, we call it, is to uh, build capacity uh, and sustainability for the nonprofit sector and the voluntary sector. So uh, we do that in a few ways. One of them is through uh, academic certificate that we offer in nonprofit sector leadership and innovation. And it's an undergraduate certificate that's open to any student here at the University of Regina. And the other way is by this broader network that is kind of broad and ambiguous with a purpose because uh, it creates space for lots of different opportunities and that could be partnerships in research that could be just networking professional development and um, there are lots of little ways that that network builds connections and capacity in the nonprofit community. Um, so I think the main way would be we offer professional development and networking opportunities to bring folks together to have conversations about the challenges that they're facing in the sector and um, you know how we can collectively address some of those challenges. Well, my name is Dwayne Elvram. I'm the executive director and co-founder of City Studio. Uh, we're a charity in Canada that uh, has the charitable mission to increase collaboration between uh, municipalities and post-secondary institutions. Uh, I come to this work from 21 years of teaching on campus, working in administration as an assistant dean, academic advisor, sustainability educator, and an experiential educator. Um, my name is Magda Gomans, and I'm the manager of Community Campus Engage Canada, or as we call it, CCE Canada. Community Campus Engage Canada is a national network and community of practice that fuels research and learning partnerships between academic institutions and various community partners, various community organizations. And what we aim to do essentially is connect people, ideas and resources, essentially to assist in the process of doing community campus engagement work. And so a lot of what our efforts involve is supporting the people who are involved in this work up close, developing those relationships, strengthening those relationships, basically. And so the people that we aim to support include community engagement professionals, faculty, community partners, and students. And I'm Betty Rice, Communications Coordinator for Community Campus Engage Canada. We're so pleased you've taken the time to connect with us for this discussion about community engaged learning. You'll be hearing more from our panelists who introduced themselves off the top of this video as they discuss community engaged learning, what it means, the roles and responsibilities of the various partners within a CEL initiative, the challenges each of the participants might face in developing authentic and reciprocal activities that benefit all of the participants. And we'll also take this opportunity to share with you some information about a pan-Canadian community engagement project called Network to Net Zero, of which CCE Canada is proud to be a part. We'll get to that a little later on in the video. So thank you again for joining us. 
You may be someone with little or no experience in community-engaged learning. You may have done some work in this area, or you may have deep experience and exposure to CEL practitioners. You may be directly involved in the Network to Net Zero project or interested in knowing more about it. Whatever the case, our goal is to provide information that will be of use to anyone and everyone interested in facilitating community-engaged learning experiences. To start things off, we asked our four panelists to share with us their definition and interpretation of community-engaged learning, what it is, and how they define it. I would say that community-engaged learning is um, creating the opportunity for students to um, understand and apply the knowledge that they're learning to the challenges uh, that our communities are facing. So we know that a lot of these challenges in our communities like poverty, like um, health, infrastructure, um, inequities, they're all interconnected. So I think it's a great opportunity for students, regardless of their field, to have that opportunity to um, apply the theories and um, kind of bigger picture critical thinking pieces that they're learning in university. When thinking about the definition of community engaged learning in our work at City Studio, I really start to think about how I think this is very noble and very important work, this idea of engaging and engaging relative to community. But I think we really have to examine what these terms mean, and especially what they mean in 2023 and beyond in the role and purposes of institutions and education. But if I think about community engaged learning, I really think about the growing disconnection between education and what it means to be living in a place, where our schools are and where the learning happens. And there's a lot of pressure on post-secondaries to really think about their reputation in an international context uh, and the pressure on students for careers in these international contexts and research related to this context. But I think there's a missing piece around the role of schools and the definition of this work around what is it? what does it mean to be a university in a place or in a city or in a community? And what is the role of the, of the, of the, the school to put students together with the needs of the communities in those places? This is in the context of international student issues, tuition issues, and the pressures of basic funding for universities. So I think that's kind of an important piece around the importance of community engaged learning. And then the other piece that's important for me is, and the work at City Studio is that we know that in North America, engagement as a kind of measure of a, a, a student's relationship to their learning, we know that this is plummeting on campuses in North America. Yet there's an engagement science that we really rely heavily on at City Studio. Engagement science says that we need to think about what it means for a young person to use their mind and their body outside in a kind of struggle with others where individuals have responsibility and the outcomes matter for community partners. And we know that if, if these factors come together, students measure their own engagement very high. Uh, but we also know that the typical way that learning is undertaken on campuses is often the opposite of the engagement science. So I think there's really something to learn about what we know about high levels of engagement reporting and the way we attempt to undertake engagement learning. So I think there's a lot to think about about the importance of community engaged learning in the future that combines um, this kind of growing disconnect on campuses between with students and their feelings of engagement and yet what we know about uh, the engagement science. To me, community engaged learning is all about mutually beneficial partnerships. So it's partnering between academic institutions, researchers, students, and community organizations. The community organizations with whom I partner are usually nonprofit or grassroots community groups, often groups that don't have a lot of resources to conduct research. And therefore, they may have research questions or needs for data. And so I see community engagement as being about 
reciprocal benefit, mutuality, um, but it should, of course, be driven by the interests and needs of the community partner organization and hopefully having some benefit for the students and researchers involved as well. So I see reciprocity as really at the heart of community engaged research and teaching. We talk about community service learning, but it's basically the same thing as community engaged learning. And that for us at the University of Alberta is an academic form of experiential learning, which involves a critical reflection on community experiences in light of disciplinary theory. And that happens for us for the main, but not exclusively in four credit courses across campus, although as also in some co-curricular programming too. So when yep. it's done well, CSL deepens academic engagement, builds civic capabilities in its students and adds capacity to the not-for-profit sector. It's important for me to say as well that CSL at the University of Alberta, in part because of where it came from, is also a critical practice. And so it's a practice in which students become conscientious of and able to critique social structures and social systems. And CSL is also designed to motivate students and all participants to analyze what they experience while also inspiring them in some way to take action and make social change. And that social change orientation um, as described by Tanya Mitchell, for instance, is working really ultimately to redistribute power and develop authentic relationships. Next, we asked the panel to describe the roles and responsibilities of each of the partners, whether that's the educational institution or the researchers or instructors directly involved in community partnerships, the students and their responsibilities, and of course, the community partners. So when I think of the, the role and expectations of partners in the idea of community engaged learning, I really think about what I've learned in my 20 plus years uh, on campus teaching and administrating and what I've learned in the last 12 years at City Studio. And I really think it, the role that schools take and the partners where the school is probably the primary partner in community engaged learning really depends on why schools think they're doing this kind of work. And when I think about what we've learned at City Studio, I immediately think of the student experience. It's a complex brew of uh, a kind of career path, which seems like it's narrowing in, 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 when you talk to students on the ground and what they're experiencing in this in this process. I think about the issues around the growing debt students are encountering. I think about the high competitiveness. I think about the the growing and uh, and kind of um, the complex issues related to uh, student health and well being, and it, it really puts in my mind what needs to be an imperative for community engaged learning to evolve, for schools to take seriously the current student context. Um, I also think that in our work at City Studio, where we really focus on projects in the realms of three emerging priorities, that is uh, the, the climate emergency, the, the notion of equity in our world, and the notion of democracy and democratic engagement, I think there's something about the way that community engaged learning can really focus on the, con the current context of the student and the current context and likely long-term future context of what students will be moving into around climate emergency, equity, and democracy. And I think that community engaged learning that doesn't acknowledge the place that we're all in together and the pressures on uh, our young people, I think is probably missing a bit of the mark and it's really not asking what experiences do students have to have in community to act as the most potent catalyst for their education. So in terms of the roles and responsibilities of the academic partner in a community engaged collaboration, I think the academy itself, the institution, universities, colleges have a responsibility to support this kind of research and learning by providing faculty, researchers, and students with the kinds of supports they need to do community engagement effectively. So I think there's an infrastructure piece that is primarily the responsibility of the institution because institutions have the kind of resources or hopefully have the kind of resources that they can dedicate to creating enabling environments and infrastructures to support community campus engagement and, and to ensure that it's done well. 
So I think from that perspective, the infrastructure is the responsibility of the institution. I think the responsibility of the course instructor, researcher, or a professor is uh, to create the kind of relationship that is meaningful and to center the benefit of the community partner in the project. So it's not just about creating something interesting to do in class. It's not just about creating, you know, some kind of interesting pedagogy or assignment. It's about ensuring that the pedagogy, the assignments, the student activities support the ultimate objective as identified by the community partner. And so I think there is also an infrastructure element to that. Course instructors develop classes, and I think we can we can design our classes and take responsibility for ensuring the mutual benefit and reciprocity is extended throughout all aspects of the course, from the initial moment of relationship building and beginning the collaboration to ensuring that the final output is something that is useful and hopefully helpful to the partner as well. Um, I think from the perspective of the student, there is a responsibility, I think, to do the best work that the student can possibly do, keeping in mind that the assignments, the activities in community engaged learning is it's not just about getting a grade, although of course we want our students to strive for the best possible grades. We want them to engage and to engage meaningfully and to put their best work into creating some kind of outcome or output that is worth the community partner's investment of time, resources, and energy. So I think there's responsibilities for all three academic parties, the institution, the instructor, and also the student as well. The role of the student is to come with their uh, youthful energy and excitement around the topics and challenges that we are facing in our communities. And I think that so many times people who are working, particularly in the nonprofit sector, there's been research to show the high level of burnout. Um, when you're working on really complex social challenges on a regular basis, and some of these issues are really heavy and hard to work with, it's great to have um, the energy and passion and excitement that students those projects so that um, it can kind of breathe new life and new ways of thinking about these challenges. Um, in terms of the uh, instructor, I think the instructor can uh, help support the students as they navigate through some of these challenges. They're learning them for the first time. And then again, help piece together those larger systemic elements of um, the challenges that they're facing. I'm thinking, of course, with the nonprofit sector. So if you're working with a poverty reduction group, um, again, these challenges are interconnected as it comes to health and, you know, food security and um, poverty and equities. So helping kind of paint that bigger picture and helping them understand how uh, they can also play a role in encouraging thinking about citizenship and their role as engaged citizens. And for me, I mean, I'm an administrator, so I see myself as a liaison, and I know that um, instructors and professors have lots of students in different classes and research and all those different projects. So for me to be able to uh, be that bridge in between, and not every instructor has experiences with service learning. And so for me, I can bring that lens of service learning and help create a realistic project that's scalable for the course and the level that um, we're working with. And um, also get from community partner who I have kind of trusting relationships within uh, feedback about what they need and um, how we can balance that within that coursework. And then trying to take the load off of both of those parties to um, create a better balance and make the service learning process really enjoyable for, for all of those involved. One of the biggest challenge I, challenges that I've come across in building a community engagement project is time. And I think time limitations, time constraints are relevant to all of the parties in the relationship. Uh, for one thing, community organizations, particularly those that are grassroots, nonprofit, charity or organizations, they don't have a lot of time to be able to sit down with the students and the researchers and to talk through the project. Um, I found that partners often don't have the kinds of resources to engage in certain aspects of a project, like data analysis, for example. So I see those kinds of time intensive roles as being much more the responsibility of the researcher and the students. So I think 
time constraints also do become a factor for the academic parties involved. Students have 13 weeks in a semester. They have a limited amount of time to see a project through from the initiation to the implementation to the outcome. And the same also happens with instructors and researchers. Although I think for many of us, we have a little bit more freedom at the beginning and end before the semester begins, if we're talking about a classroom-based project, we have some time at the beginning of the semester to begin those preliminary stages to put the, the structures in place for the students. And we also have some time, hopefully afterward, to be able to work more on mobilization and sharing the results of the project. But I think when it comes to the researchers or instructors, it's always competing priorities with other projects that becomes a time constraint as well. So I would say number one challenge for all parties involved is the limitations of time, but it manifests in different ways. I think some of the some of the clear barriers to a kind of the either really beautifully functioning community engaged learning or what seems to me an imperative to evolve community engaged learning. Um, I see it as um, community eng engaged learning. It, it can't really be an add on. I, I see it as a kind of paradigm of learning or a paradigm of of what it means to be involved in this, this thing we call education. And a lot of that is related to the simple capacity of schools to manage what is really a labor and mentor intensive process. I think that there are a few challenges that can happen in uh, CEL. And for students, I think the challenges can be related to um, managing their multiple priorities, right? And I think that it can, because students tend to care a lot about the projects that they're working on because they get very engaged with community and um, want to do a really like good job and get very invested in these projects, that it can it can become overwhelming, right? So I think um, time management and, and managing all those different priorities that they have can be for sure a challenge. Um, but I also think that in that way, um, CEL is more equitable because it's done within the confines of a course and there's academic credit. So it, it has a start and end point that's kind of more clearly defined than some other projects. Um, in terms of the instructor, I think one of the challenges can just be that um, it, it's hard to or it can feel overwhelming as well, the commitment, right? Because you want to have um, a commitment of producing something supportive for that community partner. And it doesn't always go in a linear path, right? There are like lots of different things that can impact the success of the, of the project. Um, but that's where I see uh, the administrative position like mine that is, serves as that liaison, really providing that supportive role so that you can kind of keep the project on the on the rails. But it is also a time commitment, right? So you have to kind of invest in the time and the relationship with the folks that you're working with as well, just to make sure that it stays on track and, and goes well. And with the community partner, I would say the biggest challenge for them is particularly, I'll speak from the nonprofit sector, is that the nonprofit sector, again, there's research to show that it is um, chronically underfunded and these folks have a tremendous uh, workload. And most importantly, a lot of the time they're serving vulnerable populations. So time that they're giving to projects like this, while it's really important to train and inspire future leaders, it takes away from the mandate and the mission of their organizations. So um, I, I think that for them, that's the, the biggest challenge. And um, compensation, I think, is really crucial because we need to recognize the talents and the time that those folks in community have and can offer to students. So providing that compensation for the um, community members is really key. The concrete challenges are... Um... It's just the mechanics of what we do all the time, which is finding a good fit between the learning outcomes that a particular academic might have, but then also the community aspirations and needs around a particular project and getting that fit together. That's the challenge uh, each and every time, but it's also one that we've got some experience now with in terms of the development of our community engaged professionals who we call our partnership coordinators. That's a very difficult and tricky job, and it takes deep knowledge and experience in the not-for-profit sector particularly. 
um, to enable that match to happen, but it also requires people with that not-for-profit knowledge also um, being fluent in academic practices and languages and so forth. So that's um, a challenge. Um, time horizons or timelines are always a challenge. So the short academic term of 13 weeks and then the need for longer term relationships to sustain those projects. Um, so in our model, whilst we do work according to discrete 13 week academic intervals, those projects experiences are situated within longer term relationships which have really been building since we've been at this for about 15 years or so. Um, and so I guess one of the other challenges, the obvious one, of course, is capacity, both for community-based organisations, often with uh, very little resources, but then also for increasingly community-engaged learning units on post-secondary campuses. Um, and while it's fair to say that you know, rhetorically, many post-secondary institutions recognise the value in these kinds of practices. They often don't fund them to the level that they could or should. So that's a challenge we probably share in common. So the Network to Net Zero project, that is part of this video. Uh, we're, what we're doing through that project is we're aiming to create pathways for students to support climate change mitigation efforts in communities. So essentially helping communities to reduce carbon emissions. And through this project, we're aiming to do that work through community engaged learning. So offering those opportunities for students to work with community partners in a classroom setting, reflect on that work and potentially learn from that work as well. And so the Network to Net Zero project supports almost 1400 student placements across the country. And CCE Canada is working with four different community engagement teams across the country as well. And those include the University of Victoria, the University of Alberta, Luther College at the University of Regina, and one other community engagement team based in Ontario called ULINK Centre for Community-Based Research. And so essentially we're working together to provide various different kinds of support. Uh, CCE Canada is providing aiming to do work that supports the work of um, all the, the instructors, the community partners, and the students that are involved in these placements. And so what we're involved with over the next two years is developing a pilot student network. And we're really excited about that, actually. We're hoping to create something that grows across the country. And so the other supports for students involved there are you know, creating student discussion spaces online, offering them Zoom sessions so they can get together and learn from each other and talk to each other and really get an idea that they're part of something bigger. And then another major part of this project is developing this video for instructors and community partners uh, today. So um, really trying to help the people who are involved in this work to understand their place in it and how it connects to something larger as well. What does net zero mean? A net zero approach aims to reduce further global climate change by substantially reducing carbon emissions by balancing emissions that are released by removing carbon from the atmosphere through natural approaches like protecting forests or applying technologies like direct air capture and storage. Canada has committed to reaching net zero by 2050. But beyond simply tallying emissions levels, we need to consider how our responses to climate change affect different populations, particularly those who are marginalized. To ensure that net zero efforts truly benefit all populations, it is important to fully involve these communities in decision making and to adequately consider all needs and perspectives through meaningful engagement and consultation. Some examples of how community organizations are contributing to net zero include Developing and implementing technologies to reduce carbon emissions, for example, carbon capture utilization and storage involves capturing carbon dioxide from its source, usually emissions from heavy industry, storing it underground, applying nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions play a critical role in sequestering and storing carbon while promoting biodiversity, leading in adaptation to climate change, enhancing human health and quality of life, and supporting sustainable livelihoods. Nature-based approaches could include forest conservation and reforestation, wetland restoration, 
sustainable agriculture and agroforestry, and green infrastructure, for example, green roofs and urban forests. Engaging in climate change and sustainability education, advocacy, and policymaking efforts, this could include promoting the benefits of carbon reduction technologies, nature-based solutions, and other low-carbon activities to the general population, and encouraging action, tracking federal, provincial, and municipal government climate change mitigation actions, working with government, indigenous communities, industry, and nonprofit partners to design and implement carbon reduction programs, and exploring broader social, cultural, economic, and ethical dimensions of environmental sustainability and climate change mitigation. Some examples would include examining efforts on livelihoods of well-being and well-being of traditional carbon economy workers, for example, those who work in oil and gas, considering opportunities for a just transition to low-carbon economies and a low-carbon future for all members of society, and exploring what can be learned from indigenous cultures and other communities regarding ways of being in the world that are less harmful to the planet beyond the contemporary focus of ongoing economic growth. So how can students help? Some examples of how students can help organizations enhance environmental sustainability and move towards net zero include helping organizations develop their own climate change or net zero pledges, helping to measure carbon emissions and reductions within an organization or a social or environmental sector, conducting environmental scans or literature review reviews related to climate change, carbon reduction, or broader environmental sustainability themes, assisting with communication such as blog posts, social media, social marketing related to climate change and environmental sustainability, or to encourage carbon reductions, providing event support to bring people together, raise awareness, and engage in activities toward net zero and environmental sustainability. Magda mentioned the partners of the Network to Net Zero project. And again, the participants come from the University of Victoria, the University of Alberta, Luther College of the University of Regina, and the ULINK Center for Community-Based Research. The two-year project, which has just begun, has been developed in partnership with the Business and Higher Education Roundtable, or BHER, with support from the Government of Canada. We'll include a link to CCE Canada's Network to Net Zero webpage at the end of this presentation. To give you an idea of the sorts of projects that fit into climate change mitigation and net zero, here are a few examples. The University of Victoria has partnered with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and two local secondary schools to develop a large scale project for university students to engage in discussions of climate change and to develop projects to engage the younger students in what it means to live with climate change. Through the creation of art, course-based climate change related activities and visits to remediation sites, the University of Victoria students engage the younger students in various art and community mapping projects, including the creation of videos and the development of community roundtables. At the University of Toronto, the Department of Geography offers opportunities for student placement through a project called Urban Communities and Neighborhoods Case Study, Working with local nonprofits such as the East Scarborough Storefront Community Center and the Malvern Family Resource Center, students learn about participatory action research while focusing on community and neighborhood well being and development and issues of social justice. The goal is to provide students a hands on experience that highlights reciprocity with both the student and the organization benefiting from the work experience. The Community Energy Knowledge Action Partnership brought together university partners from several Canadian post-secondaries, municipal governments in British Columbia, Ontario, and Nova Scotia, and multiple pan-Canadian partners with an overall focus on community energy planning and initiatives, something that is gaining prominence across the country. Students were engaged to support projects developed by their partners. Examples of student activity included work to identify points of contact for organizations within municipal governments in the area of climate and energy planning in Halifax. Another included students issuing surveys to residents in London, Ontario to help the city focus their programming around e-vehicles and other low carbon forms of transportation. An end result of the project was a full journal issue of Canadian planning and policy where each paper featured a student co-author. 
At the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, the Community Service Learning, CSL team, worked with the Global Engagement Office and Student Housing to develop a mindful move-out program. Student staffers from the CSL office managed an exchange where students, particularly international students, could drop up, off or pick up furniture and small appliances for reuse, promoting recycling and redirecting usable material from the landfill. So those are just a few examples of how post-secondaries have partnered with community organizations to build knowledge about climate change challenges or to offer up opportunities for students to learn more. But why is this topic so important? And why is it critical for us to connect and build these CEL partnerships that focus on net zero? That's the final question we asked the panelists. Yes, I think the topic of net zero is really important because it is, as you said already, the crisis of our time. And it's going to take collective action to uh, tackle that challenge. And so the partnership that uh, is going on with BHER between post-secondary institutions and um, you know, organizations in community is really creating that space for partnerships. And um, again, it's, it's such a huge challenge that it has to be collectively addressed and through partnerships. So it's that relationship building opportunity um, with that other component, which is funding to support organizations that are on the ground and working in the space of climate action. So I think to answer your, your second part of your question is it's, it's so important because we are not only training and helping helping students gain insight into the work that's happening around net zero in their communities. It's also uh, providing funding for those organizations to continue to advance their work. Uh, and so it's, I think, the perfect example of what uh, publicly funded institutions should be doing, which is um, serving the public good and um, creating opportunities for students to, um, you know, manage their, um, I think, a lot of frustrations over the climate situation. Uh, in very tangible ways. I think this sort of net zero project is extremely important, given that climate change is, I would say, the biggest challenge we face at this moment in history. The students that I work with are very concerned about climate change. Many of them are altering their life decisions around climate change concerns. And so I think the opportunity to engage students in climate change action projects and climate justice projects is beneficial because it's their future. And so they want to, they want to get involved. They want to have their voices heard in this area of climate change. And so I think these kinds of projects are great for engaging young people, for um, getting them involved in climate projects, but also, again, recognizing that communities, community organizations know what is happening on the ground and they need to be able to define what happens and where we go next. So I think these kinds of projects are are very beneficial and very pressing because climate change is our current and future main challenge. And so projects oriented toward addressing that in some respect are, I think, should be one of our biggest priorities. I mean, we've just seen in the news this week, of course, how um you know, the, the most optimistic hopes that we had for defeating um, or for moving towards net zero and subsequent, you know, temperature uh, reductions in light of carbon emissions. Some of that has, has, <laughs> has gone by the wayside now and um, it's, it's, but it's still extremely important. And, um, you know, I the University of Alberta is in Edmonton, right? And we have a hockey team called the Edmonton Oilers, and the cult. It's in some ways you could think of this part of the world as a petro culture as much as anything else. And so, for us here in Alberta, we face you know a societal um, challenge, uh, which is huge, and it's because it will involve a change in the way. We live and work and have our being in this part of the world. It's that large. Uh, moving to net zero by 2050 for Alberta will mean us becoming a new society, a new culture and a new economy. So, you know, that's a big task. And so our work through this particular project, I guess, through 
Community Campus Engage Canada and the Business Higher Education Roundtable is finding that sweet spot for collaboration where we can find a place where we think that we have some folks both in the community and on campus who can help students imagine the different way of being in the world which would accomplish that new society, culture and economy. Um, to, you know, equip them with insights and capabilities for change. But I want to say I'm in a faculty of arts, right? And so it's not all about technical issues around carbon sequestration and all the rest of it. It's about encouraging our students to dream about new ways of being, new possibilities for the future. And some of that will be technological, but it will also be artistic. It will also be... Um, you know, it'll, we'll have to change our whole way of life. And so this particular project is a very modest and beginning of that kind of work where we connect up some federal government strategies with our role in higher education, which is, I think, always to imagine new possibilities and ways of being in the world. And I would say that that is a fundamental task of the university. We don't just exist as a university to equip students for the world that is. We exist to help students imagine and then participate and create a, a new and better world. So that's why this project um, fits with our goals in CSL. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video. Here's the last slide, some contact information. The CCE Canada website can be found at ccecanada.ca. The Network to Net Zero page can be found within that site at ccecanada.ca slash network hyphen two hyphen net hyphen zero. And if you'd like to contact us at CCE Canada to ask questions about these topics, to comment on this video, to ask a general question, or to connect with us, our email address is info at ccecanada.ca. Thank you so very much for watching.